Hi, and welcome to Track A, Public-Private Partnerships, a Fireside Chat with Jim Matheson and Will Roper. I'm Warren Hoffman, Venture Partner at The Engine, where I also lead our government practice. I'm incredibly excited uh, for Jim and Will to join us today. Jim Matheson is a former Navy fighter pilot turned entrepreneur, CEO, and VC, and is now a professor at the Harvard Business School. Will Roper is the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition, Technology, and Logistics, which in non-military terms means that Dr. Roper is responsible for and oversees Air Force research, development, and acquisition activities, totaling an annual budget in excess of $60 billion and more than 550 acquisition programs. He is also a huge champion of tough tech within the government and has been a transformational leader in changing how the Department of Defense does business with the tough tech ecosystem. With that, I'm very pleased to turn it over to Jim for what will be an incredible conversation with Dr. Will Roper. Roper, thanks for being with us. Uh, really great to have some time with you as a, a veteran myself spending half of my life uh, in the Navy and now half of my life in the startup ecosystem. It's really a treat for me to have a conversation with you about bridging those two worlds. Um, so out there we have the, the engine tough tech community, a bunch of innovators and entrepreneurs, researchers and business leaders. And so today's conversation is meant to help them understand how to engage with you and your mission set and vice versa. Starting with a no acronym policy, a NAP. So our, our mission today, if nothing else, is to make sure we avoid acronyms that we don't explain. One of my favorites is bluff, bottom line up front. So why don't we start with you, just frame, you know, at the end of this hour, what are the three things you hope that our audience takes away from our conversation this afternoon? Jim, I really like the no acronym policy and I, I don't understand them myself. So I don't think I'm likely to stray there, but look, I'm, I'm delighted to spend time uh, with, with you today and with, with MIT. And I, I really, we've got broad partnerships with MIT, both with Lincoln Laboratories on campus with our AI accelerator. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Look, if you take nothing else away from today's talk, the first thing is that the U.S. Air Force and U.S. Space Force want to be your government innovation partner of choice, and we know we need to change to do that. The normal system we use to buy things does not make sense for a tech startup. It may make sense for for Defense Prime, it does not make sense for most of the companies driving amazing innovation. So one, we have an earnest desire to be that partner, and we've been on the journey for almost three years. Two, we've got an organization called AFWorks that is custom built to work with you, commercial companies, to make it easy to get in the door, to teach you those acronyms and provide the dictionary so you can look them up and help you find your customer, your user. We don't expect you to be able to speak defense, to speak our language. We just wanna understand your technology and your team. We will help you find your mission. And the third thing is that over the past two and a half years, the response from private investors has been overwhelming. On this year alone, we're on track to have four times the private investments for every dollar we invest in a company that has a chance to make it in defense. And the reason we're seeing that high ratio of matching is we're not trying to make companies defense contractors. We want you to be tech companies who can solve problems in defense and can solve problems commercially. And what we want to make available is our mission and our market as a bridge or accelerator to help you commercialize. AFWorks has a specific task for me to help companies become commercially successful. That is 90 degrees out from the way defense procurement works. So those are the three, three things. We care. We want to be your partner. Two, we have an organization with a different rule set, a different lexicon, and no acronyms for you to work with. Go check out their website, uh, afworks.mil. Um, and then thirdly, understand we haven't just started this. We've been doing this for two and a half years. Private investors have resonated with what we've brought. And so if you've got a great technology and you want to work with the military, please come see us. Great, thank you for that. So we'll come back to that at the end and we'll also double click on, uh, on a number of those items as we go through about the AFWorks programs, the, the elements of uh, the programs there and how the different constituencies in our audience today can engage. So that's fantastic. So let's take a step back for a moment. Let's talk about the operating context that 
you and your team and that the U.S. is uh, is operating in out in the world today. As I say almost every day in my entrepreneurial finance course, context matters, right? So I think back to my formative years in the 80s, uh, in the Cold War, you know, almost nostalgically, because things seemed so simple then. And in the 30, almost 40 years since, things have gotten very complicated. So we've had the global war on terror and asymmetric threats. We now have, you know, the rise of China as a peer competitor. Um, you know, in your business, in your job, you have to think, you know, day to day, but you also got to take the long view. So if you look out over the next few decades, you know, describe the meta challenges that you think, you know, the, the DOD and the U.S. Air Force are facing, you know, whether it's about asymmetric threats or China, frame the context that you're making these investments and decisions inside of. Uh, it's a great question, Jim, and I, I definitely think the Cold War was a simpler time. It was before my time in defense, but a lot of the people I work with, I, I get to hear what the Pentagon was like during that period. Very focused, adversary, economically separate from the U.S., and that simplifies things quite a bit. It was also a time where technology was driven mainly by large, by large governments, specifically their military. And the U.S. military has driven a ton of technologies that now have proliferated and arguably have created the Internet of Things as we know it today. Our challenge is a little more esoteric than just simply calling out a nation like China, though we're certainly concerned about the trends that we see with China. It's more of getting the military to operate symbiotically in a global tech ecosystem. The process the Pentagon has is really meant to purchase things from a defense industrial base. And that that won the Cold War, but it's not going to help us compete in today's today's world. And so just the introduction we went through, we've got to learn to work with companies who do not want to become defense primes. We've got to learn to leverage technology that was not created on our nickel, and therefore we don't control its trajectory. Uh, we have to flow whatever direction the river is going to flow towards its commercial customers and use it for military import. That is not the way that the system works. And I already see the response in the Pentagon of, of leveraging external tech. The response is, well, we need to be able to control and ensure we understand it for the military. Well, you're not going to if you didn't invent it. So I, I view that as a macro challenge. Technology is so much faster than the Cold War. It can come from anywhere and everywhere. And the pace of change is unprecedented for us. And so learning to become a military that can quickly inject and adopt technology and leverage it is the only way I see us keeping our competitive edge. We're going to have to become adaptable, much more adaptable than we've been in the past. And if we become that kind of military, then we'll be well postured to deal with whatever particular country poses the challenge at the time. But adaptability itself in this global tech ecosystem, I view as our macro impediment. Right. So if you take a step back and we just look, you know, historically or even today at, at Russia, we look today at China, you know, sort of very different societal systems, governance systems. The U.S. has its own challenges and opportunities. It seems to me that at the core of what we're trying to do here is engage, you know, the free market, uh, innovators, capitalism and the capital markets. Um, so how do you think the, the context operating here in the U.S. makes that either you know, more possible or what are some of the challenges of operating inside of the free market system? It's a great question, Jim. And for all of the companies and their investors who are, are watching, if you've never thought deeply about the global competition for technology, it truly is a battlefield. And which nation's tech base achieves the next industrial revolution will probably have the greatest impact on the military that country is able to create. And whether that military is even needed is in question if the country drives the next industrial revolution. So technology itself, commercial technology, is a battlefield for us in the Air Force. You point out a lot of nations have a very different system. So if you're a startup in China and you get anointed under their civilian military fusion model, then you get all of the benefit of backing from the Chinese Communist Party. And that's a tremendous benefit up front to be a company with an idea and to have cash and cash flowing to you and impediments removed from you. So we need to honor that that upfront advantage is one that's significant and one we should be wary of. But I'm a bigger believer in markets, letting markets decide what ideas, what companies really have 
the ability to not just change, you know, the mission that they're focused on, but really change the world. And the thing we've got to do to be able to counterbalance that upfront picking winner dynamic that China has is to bring our entire market to bear in a way that's synergistic. Now, the commercial market, uh, you know, we have, right? That's 80% of the research and development that this nation does. Well, we in the Defense Department are 20%, and we need to bring our market to bear in a way that's synergistic. And it's not the same as the commercial market. I think it can truly play an accelerant role for many technologies and the companies backing them. You can enter at a higher price point for us. You don't have to produce at as high a quantity as you would for a worldwide customer base. And increasingly important, we can certify things they don't have to go through domestic certifiers. And for anything in the aerospace industry, the air and space force has a huge leg up in being able to determine what's safe to operate. Well, all of these are part of our value proposition. And the Pentagon's behind the time in putting its full value proposition on the table to help companies succeed. We are so much more than our money. Got it, thanks. We're going to go down into AppWorks and some of the exciting programs you're working on there. One more question about context. I think you frame in an interesting way you know, the idea that we're economically sort of coupled with, with some of our military uh, competitors. As you think about the U.S., and you think about our military capabilities and you think about our industrial capabilities moving into the fourth industrial revolution, what are areas that we need to make investments you know, either in the military or ideally in both areas to really make sure that the U.S. is economically competitive in the world, but also militarily competitive. That we could spend the whole time thinking about it. Exactly yeah, right. The wonderful thing about being alive right now is just so many areas of technology appear ready to, to ripen. So it's going to be exciting to be alive. But we also have to be wary that any technology that can be used for good can be used for ill. And though I'm hopeful that we'll be able to plot a course forward with China because we are economically independent. Working together, we could solve a lot of problems, but the path we're on now does not appear really likely, at least in the near term. So we've got to hope for the best and prepare for the worst. And preparing for the worst means keeping our eyes on technologies that could create that fourth industrial revolution and a very different military that's able to keep stability and peace to affect it. The next generation of AI is one that I'm watching. We're all familiar with machine learning as we have it today. But one of the reasons that we created an AI accelerator at MIT campus at the C-Cell Institute is that machine learning, computer vision only goes so far. It's great to have on your phone. It's great for entertainment. You're probably not ready to trust your bodily safety to it. The next generation of the Internet of Things is going to move functions where there are safety and economic concerns that are gonna be relegated to the AI and we'll have to have a more hardened, auditable, ruggedized form that's not easily spoofed, especially by mal actors. Well, you can imagine mal actors is, well, that's our game in the military. So we should be leading the charge on that for the nation and creating a safer internet of things for our nation and the world to benefit from. I think we have to keep our eye on quantum. It's it's hyped a lot, and, I, and I'm not convinced that quantum computing and encryption will be as big of a deal as they're purported to be. But we can't we can't underestimate them. And quantum sensing gets very little love, and that could be the dark horse that comes out from the the wings and and changes the the course of research. And so I think we have to keep our eye on it. Um, materials always should should have our focus, um, and I think materials have, have lost a lot of their share of voice. Metamaterials, bio-inspired materials, uh, things that tailored manufacturing are allowing us to make should, should make us take a new look at materials to affect them. And I think all things bio, which is not really what we do in the military, though we've tried to get a lot better during the COVID-19 response, especially in the Air Force, you know, synthetic biology, gene editing, these are these are not military fronts, but 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 what if we face an adversary that brings them to bear? And I think they're wild cards that the Pentagon's gonna have to do some real soul searching on the other side of this crisis and say, what happens if we face another crisis, but one that is specifically maliciously created because of the societal impacts it has and how much bandwidth it takes from our military uh, to be able to stay ready during the crisis. And we're not well 
suited to respond to that type of future, but we need to be. All of those are examples of things that we need to be focused on. And, and by the way, bio doesn't just swing to being ready for a crisis or an attack. Bio has some amazing possibilities for building new kinds of compute and right. mechanization that doesn't get the same hype as quantum or nanosystems. So time for us to put a little more limelight on it and say, hey, maybe the next revolution isn't going to come from the nano world. Maybe it's going to come from the bio inspired one. I could keep going, but I, I think the big picture yeah. is a lot of fields of tech. The battlefield is big. The partnerships need to be broad. If we're going to have the right connection in place for whatever technology breaks first. I mean, you're so right. It's an exciting time to be focused on technology and the vanguards. There's so much happening, not only in the individual vectors, but the convergence of so many of these things. So, you know, we've talked about a very complex, you know, global world where competition is happening you know, in every domain, economically, militarily, societally. Um, so let's let's go from there and zero in on, on AFWorks. Um, you're a startup, you're three plus years into this. Um, every startup has an origin story. So take us through AFWorks, the origin story. And before we go there, in keeping with our NAP, our no acronym policy, uh, try as I might, I couldn't find the, the acronym for AFWorks. And I think it may be a word that uh, is made up. So tell us a little bit about the name and the origin story of AFWorks. Then we'll get into some of the programmatic elements. Yeah, AFWorks isn't an acronym. It's just a just a name. You know, the AF is for Air Force, and we just noticed a lot of organization with works at the end of their names. So it's easy to say, easy to remember, and it ends with an X. So it kind of implies okay. some innovation. Um, the perfect startup name. It, yeah, know, it's great. I uh, I like the idea of an X factor so much that when I uh, when I wrote the 2.0 memo for AFWorks, I. I, I floated the idea of making the acronym stand for Air Force We Are X, the X factor. I saw, yeah, I, I saw that, yeah. But uh, I like that it's not an acronym. Not everything needs to be. The origin story is one I have a lot of personal connection with. So AFWorks was started when, when I was in my last job. And, and one of the drivers of it was our current vice chief, Sevi Wilson, who wanted to create an innovation organization very similar to the one that I ran for Secretary Carter called the Strategic Capabilities Office. Um, I was able to hire a, a group of mad scientists and wicked engineers, and we built some really awesome tech, a lot of it classified, but a lot of it not, like the biggest swarming demonstration that had been done and amazing high-speed weapons and big data analytic sensors, and even Project Maven, the first AI project was started at SCO. Well, uh, Sebi Wilson said, I want to create something like this for the Air Force, an innovation organization. And I spent a lot of time with him, helping him draft a charter for a new organization that would be called AFWorks. And it was created right before I came over into the Air Force. And so what, a, what an amazing opportunity to help the Air Force create something based on something you've done in the past, and then be able to catch that pass on the other side of the play and help this organization become the amazing powerhouse and commercial tech it has. And that's become a very, that's, that's true of innovation. It's become a very different organization than the one I ran for Carter. You know, we were the secret weapon shop building new capabilities to help the military win wars. And that organization, SCO, still does that very well. AFWorks just organically found the niche that we needed it to play especially in acquisition, which is a commercially focused component of our process. Not one that's relegated to the edge, a group of innovators that we give a little money to and say, go have fun, but one that's connected to the big machine, the big acquisition machine that purchases $60 billion worth of stuff per year, but that speaks a different language. And so I think AFWorks is leaving its startup phase. You know, by the time you've reached three years, you've got your grassroots efforts out of the way and it's time to formalize and become what you need to become. And what we need AFWorks to become 
is, is a senior level organization that is fully commercially focused, that is our investment arm, that is our tech scout, and that's the go-to place for anyone working in a technology that's not solely for defense purposes. And I, I think we've got the right leadership team in place to do that. And the, the litmus test is really the trust that comes from companies working with us and the private investors that back them. We cannot fail in delivering on that trust. I want to come back uh, in, in a few minutes to the both the retrospective cultural challenges you face, but also as startup scale. I mean, there's this this agility versus process, and and do we lose the specialness that AppWorks has been over the last three years? So let's come back to that because I'm intrigued by that. But if we think about the components of AppWorks, really, as I think about it, it's bringing kind of intellectual human and financial capital together in, in your programs. Um, you got the AF Ventures piece, you got Spark, you got Prime. So the kind of, I think of it as a, a triangle of sorts. Maybe you can go through quickly each of those three, uh, how you thought about the design of their interplay. And then later in today's conversation, we're gonna go out to the audience and, and give some ways for each of our constituencies to engage with, with AppWorks. So go a little bit through it programmatically for us and how it's working and lessons learned so far. Sure. I mean, the, the best way to build an organization is to is to empower it, let it go find its natural mission contribution. And then after that has taken root, then build the organization around what naturally blossoms. And for AFWorks, it's been three things. The first branch is one called Spark, and it's all about connecting innovators with people in the military at the edge, we use that term at the edge, whatever their day job is, whether it's flying a plane, maintaining a plane, operating a satellite, they have issues and probably issues that aren't necessarily solved by billion dollar programs. And the process we have just doesn't do lots of small things well. The purpose of Spark is to break down those walls and let companies who can solve problems at the edge have access to the operators who do it and to give those operators a voice and to, and to let their perspective be heard. And uh, we have competitions called Spark Tanks where operators propose their solutions and it's, it's something that's well loved and something we want to take to the next level. So if your company loves the idea of sitting down with a small group of operators and very rapidly, very quickly solving their pain points, Spark is a great place for you to be connected. Next brand. Can I ask real, real, real quick? I'm trying to imagine the Spark Tank. Or do you have different of your program officers competing, trying to trying to fund it like we see in in Shark Tank? I haven't seen one of them live, but it sounds fascinating. It it is like a Shark Tank. We've even had some of the the Shark Tank judges be our judges on Spark Tank. Yeah. And, uh, it's exactly like that. Sometimes it's the operator pitching. It typically is. We want them to be empowered. We're, we're bringing them the power of our U.S. Right. Tech ecosystem. The acquisition system, which is what I represent, the, the technology purchasing and maintenance part of the Air Force, we're there to facilitate the match.mil mill between the operator and the company. So they're a lot of fun. I love doing them. I think I've got a spark tank coming up for our mobility command. So we do worldwide logistics for the joint force. And, uh, you know, if you don't know anything about the military, if, you know, if you ever thought, well, how does the army end up showing up in Afghanistan? Well, the Air Force moves it all. We've got all of the planes and logistics support to be able to pick up and move an army or pick up and move the Air Force. We move a lot of Navy things that aren't that aren't going to flow uh, by sea. So that's an amazing, all, uh, amazing part of the Joint Force. It's not in the limelight. Well, yeah, we're doing a spark tank to see what we can do for their maintainers. So it's a lot of fun. It's just good for the soul. It's a contribution that you can make directly for a warfighter, and it's a great entry for a company that's not sure if it if it really feels a connection with national security give spark a try and see if you don't feel the amazing nice. passion these operators bring uh, the next branch is aft ventures that's our investment arm so air force ventures we shortened it to aft ventures because we're also we're also the space force and so it's just a word now and it runs our Small Business Innovative Research Fund, nearly a, a billion dollars a year if you put all the funding together. And historically, we didn't really think of it as investment. We just we just put the money on contract. But now we have expectations of, of investing. Now, we, when I say invest, we're not investing the way 
uh, a private investor, a venture capitalist, so we're not owning equity. But I use that term because we want our people to think like investors. We know not every company is going to succeed, though we hope they will. So we're investing in a cohort of companies, knowing that there will be successes and failures. But if the if it if the total cohort is our good return on investment, then that was a success for us. Well, with a billion dollars in non dilutive cash and great partnerships with venture capitalists that are matching our dollars four to one on average, there's really no downside to coming to talk with us. We're a great team to have on your circle of friends, not only because of our money, but because of the unique market we represent. And in programs like our flying car program, which is likely to be the smallest small business innovative research initiative of all time, um, the market that we represent, the user, the fact that we can go fly airplanes you can't fly domestically is just as appealing as the money we're putting in. And that takes us to our final branch, Prime which was inspired by Agility Prime, the flying car program. Agility Prime was just a program we created because, you know, we, we saw a lot of companies working in flying cars and we thought, here's a great way to teach the Pentagon how to view its value proposition being greater than money. We're an Air Force. We should be working with anyone building amazing flying things. So why aren't we working with these companies to help them get their safety certifications for us? Why aren't we purchasing their vehicles to do military missions and building public confidence? And it's gone like gangbusters since we've raised our hand. Great partnerships with companies, uh, partnerships with other organizations like the FAA and NASA. We were the missing component. Well, this is a deep tech program and the military should put more of its resource in deep tech since we are a more patient investor with a very different return on investment priority. And so we're thinking Prime will be our deep tech large investment program. It's running flying cars. I did an Ask Me Anything uh, yesterday on uh, AFWorks YouTube website. You're welcome to watch it. And I've got a poll out on Twitter right now asking you what should our next deep tech program be? So you can go give us your vote for the next six days. My Twitter handles Will Roper, where the E is a three. And we'd love to hear where you think we should focus in deep tech next. And Prime is our organization to do that. And the great thing about this organizational structure, we didn't start with a clean sheet of paper and say, this is what AFWRC should be. We gave it more of a mission, go help us be the best innovation partner in commercial tech. And these efforts naturally grew up. So I think they're a good place to organize. And I hope companies watching will be energized to engage with, with all three. That's awesome. So at Will Roper, where the E is a three, would, uh, fascinating to see what you hear from this crowd and, and others. Uh, so let's talk about quickly about Agility Prime. I'm, I'm fascinated by that, you know, programmatically, but also that would ease my commute around the Boston area considerably. Um, so it seems like uh, we talked earlier, we we're trying to uh, avoid picking winners. So traditionally, you know, the, the US DOD system has, has sort of assiduously avoided that. Um, but we're trying to create, again, military capabilities, economic capabilities here in the US. How does flying cars sort of fit that? Is this, is this an investment in industrial capability? I certainly can imagine the military need for that. So how do you, how do you balance those those two sides when you make these investments? And when can we get a, by the way, when can I get a flying car from the Air Force? <laughs> coming, coming soon, Jim. I, so, I, I'm ready to go fly in them now. So I, yeah, I think, me it's too. Be, think it's gonna be faster than people think. Um, I think the urban environment's gonna be the toughest challenge, no surprises there. But in a lot of the remote parts of the country, especially the middle of the country, which doesn't have the same level, same density of economic development, I think flying cars are going to shrink the nation and allow us to have greater room to grow, grow with the potential for a fourth industrial revolution, shrinking your nation so that geographical distances aren't an impediment is a great thing. So the key to Agility Prime, and we could easily have screwed this up, and if we don't watch out, we still could. He still may have it, that's right. Yeah. But we're, we're focused not to, is that we're bringing our military mission and market to bear, but with the boundary constraint that we will not change the tech base in a way that pulls it off of its commercial trajectory. Interesting. Could easily have come in and said, we're gonna do an Air Force flying car program. Here are my requirements. 
I needed to fly this far, carry this much payload, have this number of crew on board. And if I had done that, it likely would walk away from those first commercially viable flying cars we're working with now. So the key was to put the boundary. We're not trying to create a military flying car program. We're trying to create flying cars for the nation. And we want the military user to be the first user to help build confidence in them. And so we're constraining the vehicles to ones that are on a commercial track. And then we're applying them to military missions and competing them against each other to see which one is the best one for the purchase. It could be more than one. So you're, we're competing in the military market, but bounded by a commercialization track. And that's exactly the way prime programs should run for AFWorks. We wanna shift the market uh, ahead. If the nation gets flying cars first and we stabilize that industrial base in the US, then Agility Prime has succeeded. If we accelerate the market and it ends up moving overseas, we didn't succeed. And if the market happens in another country first, we didn't succeed. This is about making our industrial base get to the finish line first. And if that happens, then the military has access to the tech. And it's very mindful that, uh, that dual use technology first has to ensure that it's viable globally, or at least mostly globally. Uh, if it's going to be stabilized without significant military backing. And if we're, if we're seriously backing in the military, having to prop the market up as opposed to catalyzing and accelerating it, it's not likely to succeed anyway against, against other competitors who have more of a global ambition. So Agility Prime really is the first program like this in the Pentagon. And the response from private investors has been amazing. I mean, we've put significant money, over $100 million of government funds in, but that has uh, literally made it rain for companies that are working with us, because, not because of the money, but because we've said we're going to safety certify and put our pilots in the vehicles and start flying them. So I've got some really excited companies uh, who I'm not ready to announce yet, but I've, I've been seeing their the, the images they've been sending us and they've already tricked out some of their vehicles and Air Force livery. So it's just a really cool, really cool time for discovering innovation partnerships. And I hope in future, if anyone's building something cool and new, that they'll say, you know what, the Air Force or the Space Force is a really great innovation partner. I'm going to go work with them, see if they can help me. And uh, if we're doing our job, we should. That's cool. I mean, I love flying cars as the first, you know, as the first main program. Um, you know, both conceptually, but also you, you sort of said it, said it in a subtle way, which is you can't steer this toward military requirements. It's got to be commercial requirements. I mean, it sort of sounds simple, but I mean, the implications underneath of how you and the team operate, how we engage with the commercial sector and the startup companies is enormous. Um, so, I mean, I applaud, I applaud that. We'll be wishing uh, the companies and the Air Force well in that. So let's talk about how you deploy capital. Um, in observing over the last handful of years, it feels like one of the big innovations is again, a simple thing, but a profound thing, which is how you deploy the SBIR, the innovation research grants and, and the tech transfer, the STTR money, both in a phased way, but also with open solicitations. So can you talk about sort of what we've learned from that, how that works and how our audience can think about engaging in those mechanisms? I'm, I'm happy to do, do it, Jim. I'll walk you through our app ventures process, which is, how we get you in the door and grow you towards a military mission. If, if you forget this, uh, we'll provide the link to the AFWorks website. You can find everything I'm gonna say there. Uh, AFVentures has three steps, three, you know, when everything comes in and it, it ends up making sense for this. The first, the first phase is, is an open solicitation. So it's called either uh, an open topic, which means we're open for anything, or other times we'll do what's called a commercial solutions offering, which means just bring us anything you're building commercially. And the point of both solicitations is you don't have to frame your technology through the lens of a military mission. Just tell us about it. And then uh, when, we, when we award these contracts, our purpose is to help you find that user mission. So our goal every year is to do at least a thousand of these small, around $50,000 entry awards. Think of it as getting your, your foot into the Air Force and Space Force door. Now, what does that 50K award do? It gets you a connection with us. You start getting some company mentoring to find your mission and user. 
it's money you can use to travel if you need to go meet with that user. So it's, you know, you're not having to make difficult capital decisions within the company itself to grow your, your military potentiality. And then, but ultimately it, it's really meant to provide that acceleration function to get you to a phase two competition where the customer, the mission owner is there and they make the decision about whether you get a larger award between 1.3 up to $3 million. And, and this is really meant to prototype. So phase one is about analysis and customer discovery. Phase two is about prototyping. Let's apply your technology, no kidding, to a military problem. And in some test or experimental way, see if it can solve it. Phase two is really important from a private investor lens because the customer makes the call and the customer has to bring their own funding. So we match our investment dollars with customer dollars one-to-one. -one. So if you get a phase two award, that tells any private investment backers you have that a customer who didn't have to put their money on the table did. So it's a good indication of product market fit for the military and that has induced this matching phenomenon we've seen. If we got rid of the customer dollars, I think the whole AppVentures process would, would implode on itself. There'd be no product market fit. And then the third phase is you could probably guess, it's taking some big bets. These can be as, as large as $50 million, as small as, you know, as seven or eight. And we plan to do, I didn't tell you, we plan to do about 300 to 400 medium bets per year for phase two about 20 to 30 big bets. And these are these are meant to take a truly big idea and give them their chance to get not just prototype, but production run. You should end a big bet. These are called strat fives, strategic finance increases, where you have been able to fully demonstrate your tech. And if successful, you've got recurring revenue from an Air Force mission. Now I've realized that the strat fives, because they go so big, they're so large, we needed to create one more rung. So we're gonna have tactical fund increases as part of phase three that, that we'll be able to do more of, but they don't go as big. So not every company has this like moonshot type idea. Sky shots are fine too. And uh, we need them all. So, you know, the, the thing I'll tell you, our process we think is pretty good. We think it makes sense to private investors who are partnering with us, but we also wanna hear from companies and hear from people who are new to the government. How should we continue evolving this so that it's easier and easier to work with and a natural, uh, natural synergy with the way private capital works? A question for you. I mean, when I think about whether I'm running a business, I know what my metrics of success, you know, revenue, market share, margin. When I was running a venture firm, you know, you look at the portfolio and the returns profile. Like when you're going to brief, you know, your boss, uh, what what are the key couple of key metrics where he's saying, you know, how how is this going, Will? How, how are we doing? What are the key metrics you're looking at, and how are we doing against those? It's pretty easy for me with Secretary Barrett. One of the first things she did when she became the Air Force Secretary was to go see a live pitch event for space. And she's a huge proponent of us being the commercial innovation partner of choice. So it's been really easy for me. There are three things though that, that you need to measure AFWorks by if you're a government official like me. The first and the most important is that at a portfolio level, capabilities delivered to our warfighters. We won't be able to look inside the portfolio and tell you which individual company is gonna succeed, but we're investing a billion dollars a year with significant matching funding, about 600 million uh, this year alone. We need that to ultimately deliver capabilities to warfighters they wouldn't have got ultimately. That's doing our mission. Thing two, are the companies that are members of the AFWorks classes, the AFVentures classes, are they successfully commercializing if they want to? Or are they stuck in defense? If they get stuck, then, then we haven't done our job to make our process and market an accelerant towards commercialization. We want defense unicorns. We want companies without billion dollar founders to make it to that billion dollar evaluation because they worked with the military. And uh, blue unicorns, Air Force and Space Force unicorns are the best color unicorns of all, of course, I'm biased there. But Navy unicorns and Army would be, would be well appreciated as well. But what a shame that there haven't been more. 
I mean, you get the benefit of our money and market. Why isn't it a delineated advantage to work with us? It's such a shame. It speaks how backwards our process is. If we don't change it, we're going to be isolated. This five-sided building I work in will become a five-sided island where we are marooned inside a very small piece of the nation's tech. We've got to change it. So are we creating that commercialization success? And the third, and maybe this is the most important, is user experience all around. Are the operators, the acquirers who work for me, and most importantly, the companies and their investors, do they have a good experience with this? Even if they weren't selected, were they, did they have a good experience? Did they learn? Did they feel like they were better poised to come back another time? If the latter ends up being yes, resoundingly yes, we will get the first two right because we've got the talent to do it. If we get the third wrong, then the first two won't matter for very long. Yeah, got it. From the users, I mean, there needs to be clarity of process, right? So it's the no acronym policy, all the work you and your team are doing to educate and engage, but also there needs to be predictability of the milestone funding, right? Um, the matching is so important on both sides um, that there's a true financial partnership. Um, as we think about budget cycles and things, is that is the matching or the dollars that you're working with uh, are there any risks to those dollars? And what can we as an innovation community do to, to help you make your case against these three metrics? It's the hardest part. The thing that you would not see and you don't need to understand at all if you're in commercial innovation, but just know it exists. It's important you know it exists, is the very unwieldy process with which we have to build our budget. There's eight and a half pounds of laws and regulation governing how we spend money if you print it all. There's a tremendous potential to get to know. And then even more cumbersome is that we do budgets two years out, and that makes zero sense in technology. So what we are doing with AFWorks is truly hacking this onerous process to make it as user-friendly as possible, but we can't perfectly hack it. You know, hackquisition is a term that we've made up for trying to make this process somewhat user friendly. The thing that I would hope for now, I guess, I think we're ready for this now, is just engagement with uh, with your local officials, state officials, you know, Congress, uh, because we need to change the rules for how we work with commercial companies and tech companies. We can have one budget process to go by stealth bombers and satellites and ships. But we need a, a different process to work with companies that have a much tighter cycle time. And uh, if we do that, then uh, that's going to remove one of the big impediments, which is right now, if I build my budget two years out, how do I deal with discovery? How do I deal with that amazing company that walks in and says, hey, I've got this thing, but I need your help in the next two months, or I've got to go take money from a different source and I can't come solve your military problem. We hack around that right now. It would be great if we had a process just built to do that. Got it. I mean, what you're describing, you know, in three years, I know it, it has a lot of precedent before the three-year AFWorks experiment. Um, in three years in, in startup world and dog years is more like 20 or, or 30, so I can appreciate that to be sure. Uh, I, I'm wondering if you, in retrospect, like what has been the bigger cultural challenge? Has it been internal to the Pentagon, to the Air Force and Space Force to get, you know, the airmen and leadership there to, to understand and to change the way of being? I can certainly imagine, you know, the, the Navy would be difficult to change in that way. Or has it been this, the external engagement, educating the innovation community and getting them to understand and believe what it is you're saying? So internal or external, do you think, and I'm also curious as you've gone through that, what have you learned about yourself as a leader? Because you've, you've led a pretty big strategic transformation and a cultural transformation. Oh, a lot of questions, Jim. So firstly, the external engagement has been easy and amazing. So all of the, the illusions you see in media and sometimes through public officials where they say, Silicon Valley or pick your tech hub doesn't work with the military. I haven't found that to be true at all in three years at all. I found that um, companies, companies view their value proposition and their, their core mission. It, it often aligns very well with ours if we get words out of the way. 
And I definitely think a window of opportunity occurred during China's engagement on Hong Kong. I think that was an eye opener for for many companies and investors uh, who you know had seen China as a you know growing nation and were hopeful about its future, and then realized that there have been changes in recent years that have have made it more of a crackdown authoritarian regime. And we certainly hope for better for China in, in the future. But but right now it's it's a country that's it's going a direction that's very different than our values and the values of many companies who want to create technology to change the entire world. Well, you may not know this about the, the military, but we I mean, our strategy is to train and equip militaries around the world. We sell more stuff to, to uh, partner air forces uh, than anyone. We train, we train them exactly as we train our own pilots. That's a big part of how we think about security. It's a globally shared burden. Very, it's something that we do very well, and uh, it's something we should make make known more more frequently. A lot, a lot of people find it strange. Like you sell you sell your fighters to right. yes, of course we do, and and don't just sell them. We we train them here. They fly in our exercises. The idea is if we have to go into some engagement, we already know each other. We we engage the same way, and and, and there's trust built. So a lot of companies have really resonated with that and do not like the more authoritarian approach that they've seen from China. That's opened up doors and I found external to be wide open. Internal, the biggest challenge is just rebooting the Pentagon to not think of small businesses as tantamount to small impact. I hate the term small business. It's in law. I can't change SBIR. It's in law. I would do. It's venture money. It's it's our future, and I I think the Pentagon does think if you're a small business, you can't have a small impact. That's completely not true. Uh, the there's a certain size company. Uh, you know, when you're in that fifty to a couple hundred people, you've got amazing agility, but the, the ability to make real impacts. And that's been the biggest change is rebooting that. In terms of myself as a leader, I, I don't I don't really think of myself as a leader. I'm trying to solve problems here. You know, I came into this prop, into this job. My last job, I was trying to help the military get ready for what would, what will be a very different future conflict. And I was asked to do this job by you know, Seve Wilson and and then Chief General Goldstein because they wanted to just see if I could solve problems across a service as a whole. I think the area I've had the most growth is just learning to learning to try to solve problems at a very big scale when you run an organization that's very large. It's a different skill set. I've had a lot of great mentors and partners here. And the thing I've learned is that what works at small scale does work at a big scale. But the way that you message and articulate that message and mechanize it has to have a lot more deliberation and repetition. Mm -hmm. If you ever end up in a job like mine, the only piece of advice I'll give you is whatever your message I'll give you two pieces of advice, and I'm not a big one for advice. The first is that whatever your message is, you cannot you cannot over repeat it. You have to repeat it over and over to get it through all the layers uh, that a bureaucracy has. And the second is to watch where your time goes. Bureaucracies are masters at burning time in in fireplaces that do not heat the topics you care about. You have to be very disciplined to make sure your time goes to things you care about. So I've learned a lot and I'm just, for all of those who've had to go through my growing case, we have not gotten everything right with AFWorks. Uh, so I'll just personally apologize. I've not always given it the best guidance, but I'm learning from the mistakes we've made and hopefully we become a better enterprise because of it. Yeah, no, no doubt that you are. Um, I love that the over communication you can't, and the time the fireplaces will burn your time. I love that. I think that's true whether you're leading a ten or you know or a or a million uh, person enterprise. Um, let's let's do a quick rapid fire. Uh, take a break from these topics, and I'm going to ask you a series of questions. And the beautiful thing is you can give me very simple answers. You don't need to explain yourself. This is the one time today you don't have to explain your answers to anybody. Um, all right, ready? Here we go. Ready. So what is your favorite aircraft of all time? SR-71. Oh, excellent. All right. What book have you, uh, have you recently completed that really had a profound impact on your thinking? Flatland. 
about seeing the world a different way. All right, Edwin Abbott. Got it, thank you. Okay, so you have a rare uh, free afternoon. Uh, would you spend it uh, in Oxford, England, watching the Christchurch Regatta and having a beer there or uh, in Cambridge, Mass, watching the head of the Charles? Uh, I would be in Oxford as long as you let me switch to a PIMS. I'm all for okay. an end of jail, but if we're, if we're watching the regatta, it's PIMS time. Okay, good. Where do you think humans will set foot first? On the moon again or on Mars? On the moon. It's just a natural stepping stone to get the tech developed in a mission that's more easily achievable. But going back to the moon, I'll tell you, that'll, that will be an amazing thing for the nation. So I... I hope I get to somehow help. Yeah, I mean, I'm just old enough. That's one of my first uh, formative memories uh, of the moon landing. I just um, got okay. This is fly, it. yeah. I just got to fly in a U2 recently, which is about as close as oh. I'm likely to get to space. But yeah. seeing the curvature of the Earth from that altitude, that does something to you. It was an amazing experience. So it, it has lit a a passion for me about space, which I've always had, but it's. Mm. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, uh, the final one is actually an unfair one. And given your various uh, and many degrees, um, do you think that mathematics or physics is the more fundamental topic to understand how the world and science works? Oh, boy, we're in philosophy. I can't give you. Yeah. I, I will have to give you an explanation on this. I, I think... I, you can argue it both ways. And I'll tell you what mathematics appears more fundamental uh, because we start with basic logical principles um, that appear to be self-evident and we derive all other logical implications from them. But, but by, 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 by proof, provably, it is an incomplete system of logic and, and no one knows how to complete it. On the other side, the physical world is, I, I know philosophy majors and philosophers will say, well, that's arguable, but from a physics, physicist's point of view, it is. And regardless of what postulates we make about mathematics and what implications we derive, it exists and it obeys principles that appear to align with many of those logical principles. So I think it, it, mat it matters. Do you believe that, that logic itself is the more fundamental thing or is that a human construct or is the universe itself a more fundamental thing? And the logical principles that we apply to it are actually inherent to it, not, not a construct we create. That is a great topic for debate over a PIMS while watching the regatta in Oxford. So if you Perfect. can let come back to that question, uh, that would be a lovely afternoon. Excellent, I look forward to meeting you there. And as you've seen, uh, behind Dr. Roper, the, uh, the zeros and ones, the matrix. We just sort of went only part way down the matrix uh, on that. So I look forward to that follow on conversation. Let's take our last you know, almost 10 minutes uh, together uh, to talk about you know, engagement with the Tough Tech community here at the Engine Tough Tech Summit. Um, if there's one misconception you'd like to correct for this, for this group, and then we're gonna kind of go group by group and see how we can engage them. What do you think the biggest misconception you'd like to correct or resolve for, for this crowd about, about what you're doing and about AFWorks? I, I, I hope there aren't big misconceptions, but if I had to guess that there, there is one, is that we think we've arrived. We've begun. We've not arrived. We have broken through this this restraining chrysalis that has been holding us back and we've pushed our hands out towards flight. Uh, but we have not proven, we've not broken any air records yet. We have a long way to go. And so though we're very stoked about AFWorks, I'm personally proud of all the amazing people who have, who have made it what it is. We have a long way to go, to go. So if you think that we're done, we're not. Though we're excited, we're excited more about the future than we are about what we've accomplished. And uh, we, we're open to your suggestions. So, you know, don't be shy reaching out. We're trying to get outside of normal government communication. Doing a poll on Twitter is very different for, for Air Force acquisition, the Air Force as a whole. Why not? It's easier to reach. You know, it's, it's simple to do. Why don't we do those things? So reach out and tell us 
how we need to evolve. We have not arrived. We've just begun. Got it. If, if I could give you sort of one thing to help you amplify the mission, would it be more people? Would it be more money, more collaborations, different, more or less regulation, a, a more defined technology future? Like what's the one thing you wish you had, you know, that you don't have today to amplify your mission set? I wish I had a flexible account to help me transition successful investments to their permanent bill of sale. And that is something that the Pentagon, really the government's budgeting process makes exceptionally challenging because we budget two years out. And in the tech startup world, who knows what's going to happen in two years? As you said, in dog years, that's 14 years away. So if I had an account that, that was for something I didn't know what it was going to be, and I could convince the Pentagon not to take that money or Congress not to reappropriate it, then I could be ready for the opportunities, discoveries, successes that cannot be forecast two years out. I can forecast things in the stealth bomber world. I can't forecast at that level in the tech startup world. That would help me tremendously. Not even more money, just more flexibility in deploying it. Interesting. Got it. Okay. Um, so out in the audience, we have you know a variety of folks. So you know, lumped into you know technologists, entrepreneurs, and venture capitalists. Let's say investors, and there's many more. So like, what is your what's your main message to the the technologists and the researchers about what you're doing and how to engage? Um, what one? If you're working on it there's an application to the Air Force and Space Force. There's not a single technology you can dream up that wouldn't apply to our missions. Challenge us on that. I dare you to come up with a technology that, that has no purpose for us, or at least for the military. Uh, and then the second thing is that we wanna be an even more trusted partner in deep tech because we don't have equity concerns. We're not looking for de-risked investment opportunities where the returns are going to come quickly. So we want to place more concerted bets in areas of deeper tech. And then for the entrepreneurs and investors, uh, that, that ought to be something that we'd hope you would be excited about because a company that you may be on the fence about putting your own money in, maybe it's easier if we go in together. So we hope that we can often be the tiebreaker or, or catalyst for more deep tech investment. And what a lot of uh, investors have shared with me, a lot of the folks who were there when Silicon Valley began, they lament that the kind of investment that built the valley uh, that went for longer term, bigger ideas is, is starting to wane with 80% of investment going towards more de-risk software drive take capabilities. Well, rather than just bemoan that trend, we could use our military market and funding to help rebalance it so that we've got a more balanced tech ecosystem. You and I are sitting here uh, in 10 years at the Tough Tech 2030 Summit. Hopefully COVID and lots of things have passed by then. Um, um, what, what, does, what does this all look like? What does success look like in 10 years? And what, what, what is the core challenge we have in 10 years that we're talking about then? Well, anyone who's a true technologist will tell you that any prediction about what technology is going to be the thing we're talking about in 10 years isn't a real technologist. The fact that there's so many is what's exciting. What success will look like is a lot of magnificent, large tech companies that were those defense unicorns are creating that, in, that next industrial revolution, are changing the world with their tech. And when they tell their origin story, they say, I got my first chance with Air Force or Space Force dollars. And no, I'm not a defense prime, but defense mission is part of my company's background. It's part of my company's identity. And when the military says I have a tough problem to solve, that's part of what my company does. I want our 21st century industrial base to consider itself what we call dual use, where they're technology companies and their uses apply to both commercial and military missions. If in 10 years, we've got some of those unicorns, some of those examples of companies making it because of partnership with us, then I hope it creates the trend where 
people with big ideas, come see us. Um, not, not exclusively, but come see us as part of their partnership model to succeed. And given all the values we have, the money, the different market, the ability to certify, that's not an unreasonable expectation. So in our last couple of minutes, back to the beginning, the bottom line up front, you said number one is that you care and you want to be the partner of choice. Number two, you have an organization in AFWorks and broadly in the Air Force and Space Force that's ready to engage. And, and third, that you have the capabilities to, you know, to invest and partner and help these companies get to scale. Um, as you reflect on our conversation, anything else you'd like to add to those those three or any final words for the, the group? No, I, Jim, you, I mean, you did a better job than I would summarizing it. But that's, we've begun this journey. I think we've had, um, we've had good success getting out of the starting blocks. You know, we haven't tripped. We are, we are running a race that the military has had challenges doing and we want to get better. I've been overwhelmed and very grateful for the response from the private investment community. Many have said we've been waiting for a military partner. And I'm very proud that the Air Force and Space Force have been able to get there and, and to gain that trust so quickly. The thing I'll leave you with, I know how easy it will be to lose this trust. Um, one, know that we're hacking a eight and a half pound hobgoblin of regulation statute on our back every given minute. Uh, we will have slip ups and, and we do our best not to, but until the process changes, we will make mistakes. And we just simply ask that you integrate, uh, to use a natural and integrate across those mistakes and see if on the whole, we're living up to our values and identity. And, and secondly, that, um, that we have big ambitions that, you know, in, in trying to become better, what we're doing now, we have ambitions to truly not just learn to work in the tech ecosystem, but to be a valued and trusted member making valuable contributions in it. I think deep tech is one area we can do that, but I think there are others. And so the ask I have to everyone is just help us keep learning. Um, we're not expert in this. We learn every day from working with companies and investors. We have a long way to go until we will consider ourselves anything close to uh, folks like yourself, Jim. So help us keep learning is my final ask. Uh, we're out of the starting blocks, but um, it's going to be a long race, especially against a competitor as capable as China is and other nations. Uh, this isn't going to be solved in a year or two or a couple of seed rounds up to pick your letter series. Uh, this could be a decades long competition for the next generation of technology and the next and the next. And we have to have a partnership model that can go the distance. So thank you so much, Dr. Roper, for your time. And you know, personally, on behalf of the engine and the whole Tough Tech Summit, we very much appreciate not only your time, but also all the hard work and leadership that you and your team are putting forth. Uh, it's an exciting time, so we look forward to engaging and, and we'll see you uh, on the uh, in Oxford for the PIMS, and we'll see you in uh, 10 years for a follow-on conversation, I hope. So thanks very much and have a great, great day. Thank you all for joining that interesting and compelling conversation with Dr. Roper. We're gonna now take a 15 minute break and we'll be back with some more founder pitches.